Howdy folks and welcome to a podcast where we're featuring a better version of Roman Micah, that being my buddy right here. Wow, that's quite an introduction. This is Andre. Yes, you're welcome everybody. Okay, so today we're going to be talking about the best and worst car engines that we've had experience with. So I know there's a lot of them out there on both sides. And I obviously want you guys to comment below with your experiences and everything else. And we're not going to cover everything that you guys want, but we're going to do our best. Also, it is our typical format yeah. from 10 to 1. However, it's not quite, not necessarily number one is the best or number one is the worst. It's just that that's how it fit on the list. And so that's how I did it. Okay, w so. Wait a minute. Where's Roman? <laughs> uh, Roman is right now having, I believe, angioplasty, rhinoplasty. Uh, wow. No. He's not doing so that. he actually, He's I was in California. You guys did the podcast for truck. So I figured I would come over here <laughs> and do, over do another one with a car. Honestly, I don't care where Roman is as long as you're with me. Buddy. Okay. Thank yeah, you. I'm, I'm happy that you're here. And so is everybody listening. So Andre rarely has an opportunity to really explore cars, but... You know, his knowledge really is in the truck world, but he is equally passionate about a lot of car I, stuff I, I out like there. anything that kind of makes noise and moves. Yeah, he actually has a tramp stamp of a VW Whoa. Emblem. Whoa. Um, and I'm not Too that soon. far out. Too soon. It's been a while. How long did you own that? Uh, that I, had a, I had a Golf, Golf TDI for 18 years. 18 years. And... And it never broke. <laughs> he beat the crap out of the thing, too. It never broke down. It just took it. It yeah. just took it. I, I'm still surprised you sold it, to be honest with you. I am a little... Because I, when I met I, him, he still I, had it, and he just... Yeah, was, I know. It, it, I sold it to a friend, and then he crashed it later. That probably broke your heart. Yeah, it did. Yeah. And that is, by the way, a really good powertrain that's in there, and we will be talking about Volkswagen, believe it or okay. not, but uh, not that particular Well, let's start. Uh, yeah, before we start, though, I wanted to th throw a quick shout-out to uh, our Patreon supporters out there. Thank you guys so much. Without your support, we could not be here. Uh, Andre, how do they get in touch with us and... Um, Help us out a little bit. Yeah, so if you guys want to get in more engaged uh, with us, uh, patreon.com slash tflcar is our only Patreon page. And the reason why I have my phone, if you're watching, is I'm on the Patreon app, mm -hmm. as I am every day. And I'm checking into, you know, comments or questions that are coming in from you guys. Um, and if, if we can answer something, then we will answer it. Yeah, uh, but I, there was an email that we recently got um, and I did want to mention that. I was going to wait until I got partially through the list, but I'll go right now. Okay. Um, and this comes from, I'm not going to be specific with his name, Lloyd, um, but Whoa. he, um, you know, that's not his name. Uh, he, he was suggesting <laughs> that we curb our language from time to time when we're bringing up certain topics or talking about certain things. Uh, for instance, and I will give you an example here. Um, when a vehicle uh, looks like it hasn't been messed with, uh, we were using the language of unmolested. And apparently he felt that that was something that we shouldn't be using because there are other ways you can interpret that. And yes. I, I get it. Okay. And we never meant any harm by that, by the way. That was how I was brought up to talk about a vehicle um, when we would do auctions when I was a kid. Say, okay, this vehicle is unmolested, meaning that it has been lowered or smashed or crashed or you know changed in any way. So we will try our best to use the term unmodified. However, with that being said, I really do wish that some people would just kind of chill. Um, I have the worst mouth in all of TFL, if the camera wasn't on, I'd be cussing up a storm. <laughs> so I am doing my best to did edit you, were myself. You, were you in the Navy ever? No, no, oh. no. Uh, oh. uh, but I did grow up an Army brat. And uh, between that and some other stuff I participated with. By the way, we want to hear from you guys. Yeah, we really I mean, do. Um, Appreciate your feedback, right? Mm -hmm. uh, everybody has a dis different circumstance, different situation. And we so, do listen to them, yeah, even so though we might we do, growl we, about it. And and we will bring it up. Yes, yeah, indeed, yeah. which is exactly what we did. And then there was a second email real quick. This one was a really positive one, mainly having to do with the fact that this one individual was looking for a car for his daughter. It sounds familiar between the two uh -huh. of us. Uh, she's in high school now, and okay. she accidentally crunched his car he had a i think it was like a later model subaru um outback and he was looking for something safe but really really inexpensive because he wanted to pay for something cash and i didn't know this was the same guy so i suggested a volvo and i don't even remember which model volvo it was, it was one of the suvs so it was like maybe the xc60 one of the earlier ones and 
she got in another accident and she's a okay. <laughs> So that was what he wanted to let me know. And that's well, the Volvos have, gr well, first of all, great technology and great reputation yes. for safety. Yes, they do. Yes. And it was a head-on collision, apparently. So congrats uh, that your daughter is just fine. I'm terribly sorry about your insurance rates, bro. I am so glad I'm not in your shoes. <laughs> Knocking on wood. You should knock on wood, too, because you're, yeah, there yeah, you Yeah, my go. daughter is getting her license uh, in three weeks. Oh, man. <laughs> three weeks. It's interesting. Andre gets to watch because um, my kid's about four years older than his. So things that I've already gone through, he's about to you're, go through. You're like the leading blocker in my, on my football <laughs> team. That's right. You're, you're kind of blocking and I'm running. But you get to you. see what I've gone through and it's like, okay, well, at least I know what he's... He, although, you know, obviously different kids, I hope. Um, so... Let's get to the list now. Okay. And, and then we'll take a little break. we got a couple of things we want to cover along the way. And also, there's going to be a video from Japan in this podcast. Yes, there is. We'll cover that in just a second, okay. though. In fact, we'll, we'll actually cover that automaker in a moment. Okay. Uh, so, once again, these are the best and worst engines that we've experienced. And we've gone around and had a look to see what other people have said. Some people agree with us. Some people disagree with us. And once again, we want your comments below. So, let's get started with the Honda B-Series Four-cylinder engines, 1.6, 2.0 liter four-cylinder engines, and they were legendary, not only for the fact that they were pretty solid and very reliable, but also they were very tunable. And a lot of people went out there and have been cranking tons of power out of these engines and absolutely adore them. Uh, the vehicle I have up here is a um, later... Um, Sorry, Honda CRX. Uh, I had one of these, almost identical to this one, which is why I, I put it. I think Roman had one of these. He too, did. He had right? an earlier one. He had the one, the, the squarish yeah. one, which is the first gen. I had the second gen, and I had, I think it was like an HI or IH or something, which was like the high efficiency one. So it didn't have the really cool power to it, but it handled great. But I had friends who had the um, much more powerful, uh, much more capable versions of these vehicles, and man, they were fun to drive. And uh, were most of these VTECs, or wh when did VTEC kind of come about? Because uh, I it know was around that it was around that time that the VTEC was definitely in there, yeah. and then there were SI versions of this as well, yeah. which were utilizing a lot of the VTEC technology. But there's something to keep in mind with those particular powertrains. Yeah. A lot of the kids who are um, beefing them up and making them like super powerful they uh, aren't necessarily going towards VTEC. They're sometimes looking at the older engines that weren't using that type of uh, system, which is interesting to hear. And I think some of it has to do with how robust those, those engines were, those powertrains. Now, speaking of robust, uh, I, we have up here the Volkswagen. Uh, this particular one is a GTI. Uh, we're talking about the EA888, uh, which is commonly a 2-liter or 1.8-liter Four-cylinder turbocharged engine. It's the code name. It, and I know a lot about this. Because yes, you do. Fire we, away. We, we mentioned VW. This is, and and uh, quickly, I'm going to say that it's not just using Volkswagen products either. Uh, Audi basically is using their own version of it for years and years as well. Yeah. Very, very good engine. And um, I was just listening to uh, Paul Gerard's bonus podcast uh -huh. with Tanner Faust. And they did discuss, because Tanner used to be, you know, in the VW camp with rally cross and That's rally right. rally driving. And he used to drive a Beetle. Remember, this was like a super, super souped up, very, very special uh, Beetle. And this is how they were developing turbocharging technologies, right? And yeah. Testing them to the absolute limits. And, I mean, I had a diesel turbocharged engine, <laughs> which is a little bit unrelated to this. But, I mean, this, there's something about two liters, and four cylinders that even in the Honda days, right, mm -hmm. like you mentioned, and VW and others, is just a perfect displacement. And then you put a turbocharger on it, and it becomes wonderful. I mean, you can see that with German cars, Japanese cars, Korean cars, Italian cars, American cars even. There are a lot of uh, two or near two liter displacement vehicles out there that seem just to do really well with turbocharging. And it's interesting. Maybe it's an ideal amount of space that's in there with where pistons go and everything else. I don't know. It's interesting. I want your perspective on that, too, by the way, uh, those of you who are listening. And there's different, like, versions and generations. Oh, several of, different. Yeah. yeah. You're showing a Mark V GTI, by the way, in a very special, I think, special edition color. Yeah. It's orange. One of my favorite of the, all the GTIs, my own personal one, at least. I just, I love the styling on these. I loved how smooth they were. And they were one of my favorite driving cars, personally speaking. And our um, marketing director, Grant, 
has had a GTI for years and years and years. It's hysterical because he he's very soft-spoken, very cool guy. And we'll talk about it, and he's like, yeah, it's leaking, but it still runs just fine. <laughs> you know, yeah, there's just some weird sound, but it's running just fine. And he's had it for years. And, I mean, he drives it hard. So and, it, and it's a fun car. I it's mean, a fun it's a fun car. chassis overall. Yeah, yeah. W- what a spirited car! I- I'm really bummed that these things are kind of going away to a certain degree, and it, it-, it is a shame. But anyway, um, I'm curious if you have had experiences with the two liter turbo or the 1.8 liter turbo. Let us know. Um, I just it's a hell of a dynamite engine, and I really wish Volkswagen could regain that reputation for building something that good. Right. So. Uh, the next engine on our list has yeah. a lot to do with Tommy. Is it uh, Peugeot? No, it is not, my friend. Is it a Citroën? It is not a Citroën. Oh. No, it is this. Jawohl, mein Herr. This is um, Tommy's uh, old Mercedes Benz that he adored. And he actually did a really good job with you know getting some parts on it and making it just super clean before getting rid of it. Um, and it's the OM617, which is... Just the absolute pinnacle of Mercedes-Benz reliability. This is a diesel, five-cylinder, three-liter. What an outstanding engine if you took care of it properly. I went to the Middle East, and there were people who had three or 400,000 kilometers on these things, forgetting to put oil in them for six years or whatever, and just driving the hell out of them, and they just kept going. Wasn't there a story somewhere from Asia where a taxi driver had one of these and drove millions of miles I in would, one of these? I wouldn't be surprised. And most li- I'm willing to bet that if there's a record holder out there, at least for European vehicles, uh, this powertrain is probably way up there on the top. Because in the U.S., the record holder is this particular Volvo, right? The 1800? Yeah. Which this fella drove, what, 2 million miles or something like that? Something this? like that. And he kept a logbook detailing every single mile. And I'm sure there are people out there who have come close. But I think this engine, this Mercedes diesel, I think beats that. It may. It, not it, in the U.S., but in other, in other regions. Yeah, and remember, this is a worldwide engine, too. It was used in pretty much every continent. And uh, they built them from 74 all the way to 91. Uh, not necessarily that late here in our market, but uh, well into the 80s with uh, vehicles in our market. And, uh, you know, the ones that came later were great, but this engine was just a legend. So... Um, I think also Case maybe may have this tattooed on his body. That's right. This engine. Well, I, yeah, his grandpa. What well, year is his grandpa? Not a diesel. Yeah, he's got a gasser. Uh, yeah, he's got yeah. the gas. But it's but, the straight but six. Still, but still Mercedes pedigree, right? Yeah, it, his is a straight six, I believe. I think. I, but anyway, but it is Mercedes. And these, these older Mercedes, another company where it's like, I wish you could regain the reputation for the reliability that used to represent. Uh, the next is there, one. Is there another Mercedes on our list, by the way? Uh, no. 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 But can I, can I say cars. something because of this? Please do, as I switch um, pictures. I was. Um, this was. I, I get fortunate sometimes, right? Because we have a relatively small team, and uh, there's a lot going on in the automotive world, right? Mm-hmm. So, um, I, I want to say five years ago or so, I was in Arizona on a Mercedes GT. You know the convertible GTC. Oh, you know, I, remember, end, I remember that video high-end car, right? Yeah. And um, this has a four-liter twin-turbo gas V8, mm-hmm. right? And by the way, now that 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 V8 is in there, a, a lot of their high-end vehicles, including AMG vehicles and GTC, including. Sure. And the engine chief engineer was there at mm. dinner. And somebody at the table asked him, so where do you go from here? You, you know, you've built this four liter twin turbo V8, this gas engine for this car and some others. And he's like, I, I don't know, this engine is perfect. I mean, well, he, was bi- he was biased. Yeah. You know, he was on the team, had developed it and designed it. But I think he wasn't actually being sarcastic or joking. He thinks there is not a lot more you could do to this engine to improve it. This that that V8 was perfect. Okay, well, uh, duly noted, and uh, we we'll, will we'll see in 20 years exactly. What, what happens. And this isn't necessarily about reliability, although an awful lot of these engines are on this list based on reliability. That's including the one that's behind me. And for those of you who are listening, that engine is the 20R, the infamous, absolutely like indispensable, awesome Toyota powertrain. This thing is a st- Astonishing, considering what it's been in, and also its brother, the the uh, 22R, uh, mainly a truck 
engine for American taste. Uh, they were in small pickup trucks and I believe the early um, Toyota 4Runner. But they were also in a few vehicles, regular cars that we had here in the States. Uh, this is Celica, Super, um, even the, uh, I believe there was a Corolla that had a 20R, I think. These engines are notorious for lasting hundreds of thousands of miles if they are properly taken care of. The image I have behind me, which is not ours, by the way, <laughs> Um, that image is showing one that has just been coated in dirt and filth and everything else. And that thing probably runs. I love the image you chose because if you are just listening to us and not watching, it uh, there's a lot of dirt in uh -huh. this engine bay. This vehicle's been used really hard and somebody wiped the front of it to just unveil. Just to show the 20R. Yeah. Actually, this engine doesn't run because where the carburetor one is now missing. <laughs> okay, so it's being repaired. <laughs> it's being, it's okay. It's okay. Yeah. So anyway. No, no. So this engine is so infamous and famous mm. that, not infamous, very, very famous. Famous, yes. Um, that I am considering actually re to repower my Buhanka, mm -hmm. van, which has a four-cylinder Soviet design engine, which may or may not be great it's easy to fix yeah and that's why it's known but there's a company that remanufactures and rebuilds 22 r's and 22 re toyota motors yes and to put in different vehicles so why not put it in yours exactly that's so, better than going electric yes I or so. even cheaper maybe to, <laughs> I to, would imagine to, so. yeah to repower so yeah. this is how great this engine even to this day there are companies remanufacturing and rebuilding these engines yeah yeah there, there are now the e that he mentioned uh, many of those are the turbocharged ones, and the turbocharged version of the 22R is known throughout the universe as being very tunable. There are a lot of people out there who are cranking over 300 horsepower out of these things and still man managing to get fairly decent gas mileage. They're just such good engines. The reason why they disappeared essentially is emissions, um, and that's why Toyota went up to the ZZs and BZZs and all these other, you know, things that came later on. And many of those could have been on this list as well. Toyota really does have, especially with four-cylinder engines, well, actually some six- and eight-cylinder engines. Yeah, but this one is more accessible to more people. That's right? exactly my I point. I mean, 2JZ is an amazing engine in the Supras and others. Yeah. But... I mean, it was it's high end expensive engine as well. Exactly, and we're going to be covering another high end expensive engine and why I chose not to choose it in a moment. Okay, uh, but that leads us to the next one. Now um, we're almost at a little break that we're going to be taking, where we're going to be looking at something from Japan. Okay, but I wanted to bring up this little thing, and this is actually a rather Ooh. interesting view. You, so this is a, like a. Can you tell what that is? Wait a minute, six cylinders, uh -huh. straight six. Straight six. Straight six. I'm covering it's got, a, it's, you're covering some uh, things, yeah. so I can't see it. Just a little, little thing I'm covering here. Oh. Come on. What is, it's what, not a Toyota. No, 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 no. What is one of the best straight six engines out there for oh. overall performance oh. and reliability it, going back it, a few years? Mercedes started <laughs> this, but, but but famously BMW. Yes. BMW. Thank you. Yes. Woo. Three liter... BMW has been producing three liter straight six engines for years. Um, and there are so many fans out there. And they they have the S38, which some people swear by. That's the older design. And then going up to the S50, the S54, several different versions of this engine. And many people feel that uh, they were even better before they had the turbocharged versions of these engines that came out uh, later. And they feel that they're super robust and capable, easy to fix in some cases, in some cases. And one of those powertrains that if you get it right, it sounds, it might be the best sounding six cylinder in the world to some ears. That is saying a lot because uh, other than the Italians, I really don't know too many people who can make a six cylinder sound amazing. So, yeah, seriously. I, I, I agree. Um, I, I have a couple comments here. Yes, please, please, please. First of all, love this engine. Um, I was also fortunate enough to recently drive a BMW M2, the, the latest one. Oh, yeah. It has basically a generation of this engine mm -hmm. with, of, what, over 450 horsepower now? But that one's twin turbocharged, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Or is it, a, is it the dual scroll? I think it's a twin turbocharged. Yeah, it's straight six. but it's a straight six. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. my point is... Other companies are now doing similar things. You know, Mercedes came out with a straight six orientation for their some of their cars. Then uh, General Motors for their trucks chose a straight six diesel. And now 
Ram Stellantis has a straight six gasoline twin turbo yep. in their trucks coming up. I think the straight six is one of those optimum, especially the three liter. And, and we're talking three liter. Remember yeah. we were talking across about the two board, liter? Across the board. Two liter across yeah. the board with the four cylinders. Now it's three liter across the board with six cylinders. Even the V6 engines, a lot of those are three liter. But in this case, almost all of these new uh, straight sixes that are coming out, General Motors has a diesel uh, three liter straight six, and now yes, yeah, Stellantis has this uh, straight six twin turbocharged monster. By the way, that V8 I mentioned, the perfect Mercedes engine, yes. was four liters. Interesting. So this, it that pattern repeats. You know, each cylinder is half a liter, right? Mm -hmm. So that pattern keeps going and going and going. Mm. Uh, that's interesting. V8s, uh, that's, a, that's a bit of a different thing. And yes, there are some V8s on this list, both good and bad. But I um, <laughs> wanted your opinion because there's so many different versions of this engine out there and powertrain uh, going into a variety of different BMW vehicles, uh, everything from sports cars all the way up to crossovers. So I'm curious to your perspective on that, folks. Uh, the next powertrain is something that I have a little bit of personal experience experience with mm -hmm. and that's because it is the vq series v6 that's used by nissan and infinity um outstanding flexible engine i have had experience with the four liter that was in a pathfinder of mine uh, i've had a lot of friends who have had a variety of different types of z's over the years and there's a 370z that's pictured over my shoulder um, that has a VQ series engine as well. And the VQ series engine is super, super flexible in terms of the block and design, all aluminum. And these powertrains were just in everything at one point that Nissan was producing when they weren't building four cylinder engines. So very flexible, very popular. However, wasn't, wasn't, wasn't there like a 3.5, 3.7, four liter, like you said? There was a two liter. Wait, what? Yes, it went all the way down, not in our market. Uh, they went all the way from two liters all the way up to four liters. May I just say something? Yeah. A very unique sound. One of yeah. my neighbor, one of my neighbor, and also pleasing sound. Really? I, I never really thought that. Okay. I, it was okay. One of my me? neighbors has an Infinity G37 Coupe. Mm -hmm. Coupe. And I know when he gets home because <laughs> I can hear that V6 coming. And it's a very unique, you know, like a five liter Coyote has a unique sound. Yeah. Or a Subaru Boxster or something like so this. So funny they're mentioning that. Yes. Yes. Keep going. <laughs> I could hear this VQ coming. Um, and it's got an exhaust system. It's not straight piped or anything. No. I mean, uh, it has an exhaust system. A lot of people with Infinities with the VQ series engines are living in my neighborhood. And I know that <laughs> because I hear them all the time because they cannot afford to get the, like, the Lexus that they really want to get or whatever. They get these. And they're just as fast. But they certainly have a sound. I don't find it very pleasing. But I do find the driving experience in most vehicles that have that VQ series engine to be pretty damn good. Uh, and Nissan really hit it out of the park with that. They know it because they've had it in so many vehicles. Now, for those of you who are yelling at the screen or your he headphones, what about the, uh, was it the R um, RB26 or R126 or whatever? What the, the straight six that's using the Skyline. Yes. Amazing engine. We don't get it here. We simply do not and get it here. We haven't sampled it. I no, mean, uh, well, I, I have. I've driven a car with that okay. engine in it, but it wasn't street legal. Um, and it also, it's not a U.S. market vehicle. So I'm talking about vehicles that are pretty much sold here. So that's why I'm just not going to talk about anything that's used in. Yeah. So okay. don't that's take fair. that. That's don't fair. don't take that the wrong way, guys. This is just um, yep, that's, based that's on fair. what we're doing. That's, that's, Fair. We're almost at the part of pausing, but I wanted to bring up one that is going to stir up a little bit of controversy. And that is because Whoa. I'm talking about... That's a surprise. The Pentastar V6. Not because of me, but because of this fellow right here crossing his arms and looking at you as if he wants to yell at you. Are you pointing at Roman? Yes, I am. There's a picture okay. of Roman next to a Jeep Rubicon on the screen behind me, for those of you who are listening. And he is insistent that the... Pentastar V6 is one of will eventually go down in history as one of the more reliable, flexible engines out there. Now, I do agree with him on a couple things. Pentastars have been in almost everything. If yes. they could have shoehorned those into Fiats, they would have. Yeah. Um, and they did it for a reason because it was a good design and won several awards. They're not perfect. They do have some issues. I've heard of everything from oil consumption to 
injector issues to the placement of the crank, you know, just a variety of different things that have been around there. And you can go on the net and, of course, educate yourself. But uh, at the same time, I've heard of a lot of people cracking 250,000 miles with these engines without a problem as well. So is it worthy to be on this list? Roman thinks so, and he pays us as such. It's here. Well, also, <laughs> Stellantis now is still using this engine, yes. and they're putting it as a generator into the upcoming Ram, Ram Charger pickup truck as well. See, I knew you couldn't resist. I could not resist you that. You could not resist Sorry. throwing some truck stuff at you folks. But, we'll, but we're talking about 2025, 2026. This engine will not die. No, it won't. And it's, it's relatively inexpensive for them to build. It's not the most efficient V6 out there. It's not the most powerful V6 out there. And it certainly isn't the most reliable either. But it's good at, like, everything. Just not great at everything, I think is a good way to put it. I mean, it's been in pickup trucks. It's been in vans. It's been in minivans. It's been in a variety of different cars. And even, Jeeps. Even a sports car. It was in the Challenger and the Charger. Yes. Which is weird, but it, it worked. Mm -hmm. uh, I put out, I think, about 300 horsepower back then when it, they put it in there. So it wasn't exactly a slouch. Can't stand the way they sound, personally. It's another just another V6. It's not a VQ. Uh, it's not. It, nor is it a really like a proper Italian V6. I, I got to say, and it's not on the list here, but the Italians, especially Alfa Romeo, they can make a V6 sound amazing. And I just, mm, I love it. Okay, let's move on to uh, another engine that is going to lead us to a break that we're going to take. When I mean break oh, okay. is I mean there's a video that's going to we're come going up. to Japan. That is right. We're going to travel to Japan. But before we do, let's have a look-see at something that you and I did. Aha! Aha! Now that image that uh, <laughs> you guys can't see if you're listening is an image of Andre and I posing next to a Mazda 3, a fairly modern one. A good looking one too, I think. But why are we raising our hands? <laughs> because both of us are raising our hands in solidarity with the Sky Active powertrain. <laughs> okay. Sky Actives have been in everything from 1.3 liters all the way to 3.3 liters. And essentially that is their catchphrase for their very high compression engines. And they are pretty stout. I've gone on to several boards because I was curious about this because uh, our man, Zach, our producer, he has one. He swears by them. And I've had and he several doesn't want to sell his. No, he doesn't. He, no. he won't. He, like his death grip on the keys. Yeah. Um, but the thing is, is that um, I've owned several Mazdas. I've never owned one with a Sky Active engine. I had one just before the Sky Active engine. And uh, from what I know and from what I hear, they've proven to be extremely efficient, reliable, and flexible. So it deserves to be on this list, Andre. Yes. And so we, we joke ar around a lot about Roman and where he is, but uh, Roman and Tommy are actually purchasing a vehicle right now yeah i don't so, want to say what it is because it's technically we can't say what it is because it's uh, for a new video series uh that we're developing but you won't expect it no you probably won't name I'm, that i'm telling but you but yeah. they were in japan just a couple of weeks ago yep and they had a great opportunity to go to headquarters of mazda mm -hmm. and show us all some of the latest vehicles that are actually at the mazda headquarters so let's take a break, let's have a look, and we'll be right back. All right, guess what, Tommy? We found the new cars. That's right, so they have a little exhibit down here underneath the Mazda Museum where you can check out their current lineup of cars. And Dad, this car is something a little bit special. This is the Mazda CX-60. So we're not getting this, as I understand, in the States, but it kind of slots between the 50 and the upcoming CX-70. So. Um, we are getting a longer, slightly larger version of this, but this is the uh, the foreign market car, and it's a great design, don't you think? Yeah, you want to jump in the driver's seat? Yeah, it's on the other side of the car. <laughs> but um, look at this interior. It's really, really nice with kind of this open pour wood design. A lot of the same similarities from what we see in like the new CX-90. Um, and of course, they're going to have different engines and configurations uh, that what we get compared in the U.S. Oh, I love this, Tommy. That's so nice. Yeah, the nice. stitching is yeah, really nice, unique. right? Yeah, you know, I mean, uh, Mazda uh, does some of the best interiors in the business, I think. They're just so elegant and so stylish uh, and just uh, something that really uh, makes a car feel special. Yeah, it's a gorgeous design and, um, you know, I'm excited to see what they do with the 70. Um, if you come around here, Dad, this is something that's a little bit interesting. So do you see where it says E Sky Active D? Yeah. I do believe this is an inline six diesel. 
But in the US, we get that new inline six turbo engine, which is excellent in the CX-90 that we just drove. We also get the inline six turbo gas engine, which is even better in the CX-90 we just drove. And I love the CX-90, but it's a little too big for some Americans. So hopefully the 70 is gonna slot between the 50 and of course the, uh, the 90 quite and, nicely. And actually I'm not you know, too sad about knocking the diesel engine. I think in cars, especially diesels, are going away, not just in America, but in the rest of the world. Yeah. Let's take a look at this one. My favorite color, Tommy, Crystal yeah. Soul Metallic Red. So, I, think your, I think your order's a little off. Well, how was the order? But it's Soul Crystal Metallic, Metallic Red. Okay. I think is the color, Dad. But um, yeah, CX-5, right, still being sold in the States. The CX-50 is kind of the rugged, off-roady one. This was the more sleek, on-road, classic Mazda design. Um, still sells really well globally. The best-selling car that Mazda sells. Um, new generation. It's a great vehicle. I like this one too with kind of this two-tone look. You got the black, the black fender flares on the, the, the love, red I exterior. I love the uh, face of this car. It's just got this beautiful kind of uh, uh, both like eagle-eyed and yet sexy and coke bottle. You know what I mean? So it's got this interesting uh, confluence of a lot of lines and a lot of uh, angles and then the rest of the car is just swoopy and swooshy and you know sexy. It's gorgeous and then this is really interesting too dad because this is the CX-8. Okay. So in the states we get the CX-9. This is the 8 which is the um, kind of the shorter version of the 9 that we get in the states and uh, I think it's a three row actually but it's a little bit more compact. Um, it's kind of cool. I really like that you know US cars are odd number. Abroad cars are even numbers but it's got this beautiful red interior which I think is fantastic with this two-tone black. Um, largely been replaced by the CX-90, of course, now in the US, but still, good looking car. Yeah, um, I think we have to show two more cars, Tommy, if we walk this way. Yeah. Uh, probably uh, the most controversial car, at least in the US, uh, that Mazda builds, the MX-30. But here it's uh, you know, not so controversial because uh, they make it in three different flavors, right? So they make the EV, which right. is only sold in the US in very limited numbers because of well, let's be honest, not a lot of range. Uh, they make a hybrid and they make a plug-in hybrid. And um, the cool thing is they have a range extender. You want to talk about that? This is great. So the, the MX-30 is a car that got a lot of bad press in the States because it didn't go far enough on single charge. However, abroad they get a hybrid and a, pl a range extender, a PHEV, um, with a rotary powered range extender, a small little unit that charges up the battery. So where this car only was rated at like 100 miles on the EPA cycle, if you had that little rotary range extender, you could vastly extend the usability. And look at the inside of this car. I think people don't appreciate the amount of work that went into this inside with all of the cork, which is of course, uh, reminiscent of Mazda start as a cork manufacturer in the early 1920s. And I also, I know it's not super practical, but the the suicide door thing is, is really neat. Yeah, I mean, in a way, it's very similar to the BMW i3 uh, in the way that it works uh, and in the way that the door is open. Mm -hmm. It's a little bit bigger than the i3. Uh, it's, you know, a small car for America. Uh, here in Japan, it's probably not so small. Same thing in Europe. I do love the two-tone roof uh, with uh, yeah. the white body. It's really cool. You know, that people think that this car looks like the Ferrari Persangue. So I think Mazda is doing something Paris right. Persangue. Persangue, sorry. Yeah, I think that's how you pronounce it. They're doing something right with the design. So yeah, it's a good looking car. It just didn't go far enough in the US, um, but yeah. And then obviously we were just here in Tokyo at the uh, Japan Mobility Show, Tommy, mm -hmm. uh, and Mazda unveiled you know, a stunner of a car. Right. Which uh, the is SP the concept. iconic yeah. SP concept. Yeah. Uh, and maybe we can just drop in that video uh, a little bit of that video to show you that because uh, as you know designs have gotten much more angular I'm talking to you BMW again Lexus uh, Mazda came out with a very swoopy uh, I would say very sexy almost Italian like design uh, for their um, concept car and I hope that it gets built uh, because Mazda when it introduced a car said that it was going to have uh, a rotary engine that powers a battery, that powers the wheels, but you know, you could slip in a rotary engine without the battery. <laughs> yeah, it's not, not far to... Yeah, why, why make it so complicated? But let's roll that video uh, before you show them this car. Okay. Okay, we're back.
And lastly, we have to finish with the design icon, the ND Miata. Now on ND3, it's got a couple of different tweaks to the steering, a new limited slip rear diff. It also has a new track mode on the ESP. And abroad, actually, they have a 1.5 liter ND Miata, whereas in the States, we only get the two liter. But easily, probably the best looking sports car on the market, gorgeous little car. I really like this one on this kind of the silver with these brown leather seats. And that stitching is just fantastic. It's almost baseball glove like. I remember on the uh, old Audi TTs. Well, question is, um, do you fit? Can you sit in it? Sure. Yeah, see if you fit. I think I'll fit. Yeah, see if you fit. This is the 30th anniversary. Oh yeah. <laughs> You sure? even, even if I don't fit, I make myself fit in these cars <laughs> because they are just great. I love these ND Miatas. By the way, can I make a comment about naming marketing names and engines? Yes. Um, you have an engine. Uh, is that a Coyote? That is a Coyote okay. under the hood of that Mustang. Uh, Sky Active is a cool name, I think. It's okay. somewhat interesting. Sky Active, you know, Sky being active. Okay, I get it. Um, but you know how Honda uses Earth Dreams? I can't stand that. I know why they did it, too. I know. Well, it's I... also it, it's supposed to be efficient, economical. You're dreaming of a blue planet in the future. Yeah. But some of these names are just silly. Coyotes, though, they howl. <laughs> <laughs> Coyotes, number two on our list, and for a damn good reason. This was almost number one. It was definitely a toss-up. The Coyote V8, what an outstanding standing engine this is, how flexible, how capable, how great sounding, amazing performance, fairly efficient too if you drive it right. Uh, we had a Coyote in an older Mustang that we've been, had for a little while now, but I don't want to show that one because I don't think it's pretty. This I think is a better looking one and it's a most modern version of the Coyote that's in this vehicle, that being of course the 2024 Ford Mustang GT. And a handsome fellow next to it. Yeah, that's, that's me. It's good, right? Oh, I got oh, oh, yes, yes. I'm kidding, it's Tommy. Um, <laughs> it's, it's sorry, I couldn't help it. Okay. So, um, just simply put, uh, I've got the truck guy here. Yes. I, I mean, it is. It's still, in the F one fifty. And it is. Is it a good engine in the F one fifty? Yes. It's fantastic, isn't and, it? And I know everybody's moving away from V eights, uh, yep. other than General Motors, but a lot of people are moving away from V eights. But Ford refuses to, you know. Deactivate this completely. Engine. I think it's because of its popularity, though. Yeah. I honestly think because they haven't advertised it or anything else, right? And they're still selling. At least I think about ten percent, maybe, of F one fifty still have this engine. There's still people who just want to keep that V eight, and so I mean, it, they have a sweet sound to them. I think they're extremely flexible. They fairly efficient. Didn't we do an MPG run with one of those, and it did really well, like better than we expected? Yeah, it did. And yeah. also now they're selling superchargers from the dealership, yep. you know, for the Mustang and also the F-150. Huge superchargers. Three liter Whipples putting on top of these. Yeah, but then you're getting like 800 horsepower out of these things. Or at least 700. Is it 700 or is it 800? Well, it depends it was, on the application, I thought it was right? all the way up to 800. Yeah, depending I, on the application. But just and, insane, yeah. right? Yes. So, uh, yeah, very good powertrain. Uh, something that, you know, I really hope Ford can hold on to as long as humanly possible because there's a lot of fans out there. And, yeah, it's a flexible powertrain because it's being used in cars and trucks. And, and even, sorry, I was just at no, the no. Um, LA Auto Show, mm -hmm. and they had the California Special Mustang. Oh, yeah? And just a GT with 480 horsepower plus, that's... That's the power of just a basic Coyote. That's I mean, that's a, that's a lot of power. Can you, just walking into a car and having that type of power yeah. and something that will be efficient. And it's not, it's and not a Shelby. It's not a special one. And from what I understand, Andre, the, uh, the Coyote is a fairly reliable powertrain. I haven't heard any major complaints about them. I've heard some minor things here and there, but nothing, nothing that really you know, rings a bell in terms of major problems. Oh, wait a minute. I see a handsome fella in this Damn picture. Damn straight. Check it out. I'm wearing a Plymouth shirt getting inside of a Chevy. Um, so number one on the list... And it is, of course, debatable, but I put it here just because I put it here. And I wanted to counterbalance the Ford's uh, V8 with General Motors LS V8. Outstanding engine, extremely flexible for sporting cars. However, unlike the Coyote, they don't really use these in trucks, which is strange because I think they could. But uh, that's, a different, that's a whole different conversation. Well, versions of these engines, like, right, so... Blocks, I think, are very yeah, similar. Yeah. Not like head design and other design, but but yes, V8, GM V8 is special, very special. The picture behind me is showing a um, slightly older uh, 
Chevy Camaro uh, ZL1 and a Chevy Corvette. And it's important to note those things because they have this powertrain. And they range from 4.8 liters all the way to 8.4 liter version of this powertrain. Uh, they've used automatics, manuals. Um, I think there's a dual clutch version out there somewhere. Very, very well-known engine. A lot of people like to use them as crate engines for a variety of different builds. If you go onto the SEMA floor, a majority of the V8s you're gonna see there are GM V8s. Many of those are 350s, you know, crate engines. Many of them are the LS. They're everywhere. LS swapped the world, yes. Yeah, I mean, seriously, uh, think about how many are well, out there. Well, my boat, my ski boat, has basically a very similar design engine. I didn't know you had an LS in there. Well, no, not quite. It's a little bit predecessor, 5.7. Okay. Um, but yeah, still Chevrolet I'm, engine. Can I just call it an LS and tell everybody uh, you have an LS in your boat? I might as well LS swap it. Yes! There yes. you go. Now yes. we're starting to talk. Yes. Um, really, really awesome powertrain. Um, I think that it's just, it's just kind of a legend. Now, many of you are like, wait a minute, brah, where's the Hellcat? Oh yeah. yeah. Where is the Hellcat? Yeah, it's not there, is it? Uh, neither is the, um, you know, the 5.7 liter Hemi. I made a, a decision based on the vehicles that were used on this list because initially I was even thinking about using the V10 that they had in the Viper. Sure. And... I thought about it, and I thought about all the vehicles that are out there, and it's the bonus that I'm going to add. Um, but the question is, which Hellcat or which Hemi, right? And they're all pretty good, but I don't know. I, I didn't know which one to choose, so I kind of lumped I, them all together as a bonus. Sure, but I would say a Hellcat, the 6.2 supercharged v, V8 version. The, the, that but, one, but but like, but well, not the super hot but, one. But not or, the demon. Okay, I'm not thank talking you. About, That's, well, or the elephants. Yeah, or any or, yeah, thousand horsepower. So I'm just talking about just the run of the mill 707 just, horsepower. Just the run of the mill 707 or 702 horsepower or something in the lower sevens. Yeah, if right? you think about that, they've actually put that powertrain in, in not just a sports car or so, muscle car, so to speak, but they've also put it inside of a. <laughs> pickup truck? Well, uh, just Dur a pickup Durang truck. Durango? Yes, a Durango. Uh, Grand Cherokee? Yeah. Isn't that insane? It, I think it's awesome that they actually went and did that, and you're just like throwing Hellcats and everything. So it is the bonus engine on this list. And I, 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 as I said, I had a hard time thinking about it because some of you guys are like, oh, no, 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 you really should go for the elephant because that, you know, I'm trying to think of something that you could drive every day, and this kind of sits in that. Uh, I don't really know but, how uh, reliable those powertrains are, to be honest with you, but I haven't heard horror stories other than clutches exploding. I've heard a lot of those stories. Well, and if, it, if it's not modified, right, if you're leaving it stock, I think uh -huh. reliability is relatively good, mm -hmm. as far as I know. I mean, we TFL has owned a 2015 Hellcat Challenger and a TRX Yeah, that on. TRX was absolutely flawless. And we beat the bejeebies out of the TRX, and it's still... Was perfect. It had no the, the engine was perfect. It had no problems yes. as far as I can remember, uh, and yeah, we re we used it as a race car, and we put it on the track, and we raced everything we could find against it, and we took it off road, we took it to Moab, we jumped it, we did a bunch of things with it, and that thing is just was an animal. It was still one of my favorite trucks. Just it has the sound and the swagger that I really liked, so. There's there you go. our best list. And then we're going right. to go through our worst list, but we don't have a ton of time, so we're going to go through this kind of fast. Okay. Um, this is the top 10 worst. These are the top 10 worst. Now, this is... And by the way, I don't know everything that you chose, so I, I'm i still curious what, 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 what this is going to be like. Okay, so just so you know, uh, not all of these vehicles you will necessarily agree with or the powertrains, and in some cases, they're a little bit older. Uh, so Whoa. I, I, I wanted to go bounce around a little bit with engines that I know for sure, just from my own research, working at TFL Car and having to look at recall lists and all these other things with reputations and reliability, blah, 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 blah. And also having the time to experience these vehicles in person. That's why they're on this list. So okay. everything on this list, I have driven. So number 10, this is already surprising. I I'm looking at the Hyundai. Yeah, you are. It's a Sonata. And uh, this one's only a few years old. I think this is uh, 2019 or 2018. And it has the Theta 2 uh -huh. engine. Theta 2s had several flaws, and they were known for those flaws. Uh, Hyundai has taken care of a lot of those. Otherwise, I wouldn't have bought a Hyundai. 
Um, their new GDI systems are considered far better. The Theta 2s had some real reliability mm. issues. It's easy to look up and find. I don't want to carp on the fact that you know, at least Hyundai actually addressed a lot of those, but it took time uh, in order to make sure that these engines were a little bit more stout and reliable. But I also know somebody who has got one of these and is almost up to the 200,000 mile mark, and he's, he actually sells furniture. But this is always the case, right? Uh, we're talking about trends, right? When you talk about a good or a bad engine, right? Mm -hmm. So the, if the general trend is towards the good side, we mentioned those. If the general trend towards you know reliability problems and the bad side, that's what you mentioned. There's always outliers, right? There's somebody with a broken five liter Coyote right now, and there's somebody with a perfect Hyundai Theta 2 engine, right? Right. Now, this next image I'm not going to bring up. I'm sorry, guys. I, it's my fault. It's really, what? really frosty and ugly. But the images of a Ford Tempo from the 80s, a whole bunch of Fords from the 80s had this 2.3 liter four-cylinder engine that was absolutely terrible. I have real experience with this because I worked at a wrecking yard. I actually would go and buy these, and nobody wanted them later on. Um, the Ford Tempo itself, not the greatest car out there. The... Um, there were better Fords at the time, to be sure. And unfortunately, Ford is on this list a couple times. So are some hmm. other automakers. Uh, a lot of American cars are So these cars are four-cylinders you're talking about. Yeah, so the, the smaller four-cylinders. Yeah, yeah. Uh, all iron, not particularly efficient, not powerful. Uh, at the time, really, it was more of a compliance powertrain with a ton of smog equipment on there that, of course, failed. Just not a great powertrain. Uh, if you guys, I'm sure, could debate it. The only thing I don't really remember is whether or not they were considered particularly reliable, but I just don't really remember them being something that people are like, that's a legendary powertrain, right? No. So, I mean, in the 80s, we mentioned some great ones, right? Mm -hmm. But the 80s were not necessarily known across the board as great engine decade, I would say. No, I would agree with you. And a lot of that had to do with uh, smog compliance and also yes. uh, more efficient engines. Uh, we were, we being the United States, were way behind a lot of the other countries that were putting together very potent four-cylinder and six-cylinder engines that were far more efficient than what we could build. And that's not a question of my opinion. That is fact. Now, another fact is that the Chrysler 2.5-liter four-cylinder engine was a boat anchor. It was crap. And they put it in a lot of stuff because it would run. But, I mean, everything about the powertrain was just subpar. It wasn't as efficient as the competition or many of the competitors out there. They, they were relatively flexible. They threw them in everything. But they weren't what I would call quick uh, at all. I think they made 100 horsepower, you know, on a good day. That's really terrible. They just, there was nothing about the engine itself that was particularly endearing. And what Chrysler did quite often when they wanted more power was they'd yank that puppy out of there and they put in a Mitsubishi four-cylinder engine, which was better. Hmm. Hence, once again, the wrecking yard days, when I was working at the wrecking yards, they would come in, they being people who wanted to get a powertrain out of a vehicle, they'd find something that was built by Chrysler slash Dodge, whatever, and they'd open the hood and they'd quickly identify whether or not it had a particular type of valve cover. If it was black and roundish, that was a Chrysler thing. They didn't want anything to do with it. And it, it, we might as well just crush it. If it was flat from Mitsubishi and had hmm. aluminum on it, like, yep, yeah, take it. No matter what condition, take it. It was a huge disparity between those, and for a very simple reason, it was a dreadful engine. So well, good riddance. It's good, good no, riddance. No, no, bad no, rubbish. No, now speaking no of Mitsubishi, because God forbid I be nice to anybody on this list. Well, you're kind of a Mitsubishi fan in many ways. <laughs> yes, for yeah, but for the Montero, and I get so much crap from like Moto Man and some of the fans out there. Uh -huh. Like, well, hey, listen, there's this uh, Eclipse out there. Why don't you look? No, I'm not. <laughs> I just like Montero. Okay, right? and SUV. I, you're an SUV Mitsubishi guy. Okay, fair enough. Okay, a large SUV with a okay. frame, okay. preferably, or, or at least. What, yeah. Why? Why are you showing me this Mitsubishi? Uh, this is the Mirage Modern Mitsubishi, one that's about to go away. Is, by the way, isn't it the most affordable car? Almost the most affordable car almost, you can buy. But it's no longer because right it's disappearing. It's oh. actually it's going to be off the radar. But the thing about the Mirage is that it has this tiny little three-cylinder, 1.2-liter engine that is not very popular here in the United States. One of the reasons why is that it's hooked up to usually a continuously variable transmission. So <sighs> what little horsepower it produces, which is, I think, around 85. Is, is, is drony? 
It's, in, it's incredibly droning. Now, they are efficient. They get great mileage. Yes, I think you could still get one with a stick. But the reality is, is that the U.S., the typical U.S. consumer wants something larger, more powerful, and yet efficient. By the way, may just say something about some three-cylinder engines. You mentioned three cylinders in this case, right? Yep. There's some others from General Motors, yes. even Ford and some others that are actually quite good. And they're yes. usually turbocharged. Yes. They're usually slightly larger in displacement, like 1.3 or 1.5. Well, the General ish. Motors ones are all Korean sourced or designed. Okay. Yeah, they're, yeah. They, and they the Ford, I think, with... had their own EcoBoost version of it European as well. European design. Um, so... So there is also such a good, such a thing as a good three cylinder engine. Yeah, I'm not trying to disparage uh, the three cylinder. Right. I'm only disparaging it's just this, this, specific, this specific one used in this specific vehicle yeah. too. Um, one of the reasons why it, it's a real bummer. We've driven these. I actually wrote a very favorable story about the fact that you know if you want good mileage, this is the car for you. And also affordable price. Yeah, to begin one with. of the most affordable cars you can buy. Sadly, they're going away. But this powertrain. It's not really just me. It's sort of a universal thing. Everybody seems to hate it. Mm -hmm. Everybody, unless they own it, hates it. So I'm going to, you know, just got to throw that out there, guys. Sorry. The next one. Uh, what? Yes. Well, we haven't visited the continent of uh, Europe yet on this list per se. And now we're there because that fat guy in front that's of that jeep the, that's you yeah uh he is pointing at a jeep compass which has a 2.4 liter multi-air tiger shark engine now that is some marketing my friends <laughs> multi-air tiger shark wah, wah, wah. it's Wait. just the tiger shark just never really but it's a combination of a tiger and a shark yes i know it, it sounds great but it's Everything they put it in was a little underperforming. I don't think it was a terrible engine personally, but the reality is, is that they were not considered that reliable. They were not considered that efficient. They were not considered that powerful. And it really just struck out in every way, if you think about it. Now, they've fixed a lot of these since then, and they've replaced them with other engines that have turbochargers on them, which really do help. Uh, but putting that multi-air in almost anything that was built by, at the time, uh, FCA, they just weren't cutting it. Sorry, but they just weren't. Um, and it's, it's a real shame because the marketing was brilliant on that. You know, it's a tiger and it's a shark. It's got the multi-air. it's got multiple types of air. Yeah, multi-air. Yeah, it yes. just, mm, just didn't quite work here in the States. Mm. Didn't quite work here. I actually had an issue of one of those powertrains seizing up on me. Well, didn't we, you and I tested a Renegade. Remember the original Renegade yeah. Jeep? Yeah. It had a similar... Well, didn't they have multiple power, power yeah, trains you, so could, you could choose? The the one that had the manual transmission had the smaller powertrain. Uh, and then they had the CVT. Did they have the CVT? No, they had, you see the 9-speed? Oh, 9-speed, that yeah, was, was poorly nine. tuned at first. <laughs> yes, that's right. Yes, that's right. So, and they had, a, and they're in the Renegade. And the Renegades, you know, you don't have a lot of weight to lug around. Uh, they did okay, but uh, they, I think they had to reprogram the transmission more than once or some of the engine issues. Yeah. But it was just really not a great reputation. And uh, sadly, uh, there are other Fiat engines that could easily be on this list that also probably are not considered particularly good. But I decided to settle on the multi-air 2.4 because I was disappointed. Okay. Speaking of disappointment. How about number five? Number five. So Number five, yes. And once again, we're, this list is not exactly in a particular order. Um, <laughs> although, I got to be honest with you. Whoa. This one really depressed me when I was a kid. I haven't seen this picture in a while. Mm. My father uh, owned several Cadillacs. He would go from one to the other to the other. Okay. And back in the early 80s, he bought a 1981 Cadillac. Nice. And it had an interesting V8. Uh -huh. It was called the V864. So yes. this was early cylinder deactivation, yes. way ahead of anybody else, way before. This was yes. the future, man. What a wonderful idea. Uh, what a terrible execution of that <laughs> idea. Uh, not 100% failure, but damn close to it and some serious issues with it. You know how they fixed it? They mm. basically just deactivated the damn system so it can run like a V8. That was like, okay, that's how they fix it. They only built this engine, which has spent millions developing for one year. And the whole point of it was... 
to run like a V8 when you needed the power. It would cut down to a six cylinder when you needed light power and then a four cylinder when you really didn't need power. Very similar to what they're doing today, but back then they were using mechanical components in order to make these things happen and they did fail often. And that made for a very unreliable car. We had to take that thing in several times. My father was at the point where he was going to detonate one in front of the service bay. And he replaced it with uh, a wow. better Cadillac, very similar, Brome uh, Fleetwood. And it had a small V8. It was like a 280-something, 283 or some weird small displacement. And it worked just fine. And it was a replacement and, for this. And then later... There was also the North Star V8. That was much that, later on. That that had other issues. Yeah, the North Star V8 was another one. And it, it could actually, it did this thing where if you, for some reason, ran out of coolant, it would run for a while without killing itself. It actually had the ability to do that. They did a demonstration, which I definitely remember. My family had several of those. We were a, a Cadillac family with a couple Lincolns here and there and some Lexus. But that was, Cadillacs were well, just everywhere. America. Well, so are Lexus was very American. Um, okay, so, and I'm well, putting well, this vehicle out because it was just a little piece of my childhood, and they were yeah. really bad. Now, another one here is not just part of my childhood, but part of producer Zach's and Brendan's. Ah, uh, yes. Now, what I'm showing here is a Mercury Mariner. Is that what they call these things? Mountaineer? Or Mountaineer. Mountaineer, yes, that was yes, it. That was Mount, it. Mountaineer. But it basically is uh, you know, the Ford Explorer. Um, uh -huh. And these particular ones coming from this particular world uh, in the 1990s had the Ford Cologne V6. <laughs> Can you spritz it on yourself? Is that? It that... is not that type of Cologne, my friend. It is the type of Cologne of disappointment. These well, were Is that a city in Germany? Uh, Cologne. Yeah, yeah, I thought it was like French. Is it French? Cologne? Or is it uh, Cologne? Yeah, it's both. Anyways, it's in Europe. Yeah, it does, it's in Europe. Who cares? Um, so, no. The, the powertrain itself, I think it was German. Um, they were not good. Uh, they, they didn't perform up to the expectations of what people had for the vehicle. They were underpowered. Uh, not very efficient because they were lugging it around a lot more weight than I think they were designed to even work with. And the powertrains that replaced them later on were far better. Uh, I don't understand really why this engine even existed because there were other V6s that Ford was building at the time that were far better as far as I was concerned. It may have had to do with packaging. It may have had to do with uh, pricing. I don't know. But the Ford Cologne V6, ugh, dreadful. Yeah, the late 90s and early 2000s, Explorers were not in the best Explorer uh, lore. How many do you see it's... on the road? Well, I they sold more... they sold millions of yeah, these. Yeah, but they're 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 yes. like gone. Yeah. I see a lot of first and you know generation ones still running around, but I don't see but, a whole no, lot not of a lot of these. And the fact that Brandon found one uh, or several at the auction was amazing. Yeah, and they're there for a reason, probably for some sort of <laughs> unusual ticking noise that's going on underneath the hood. Now, whoa, we haven't covered Subaru yet, and no. this is something I was initially going to get a picture of your Subaru, but yours was later after they fixed the problem. Okay. Um, so Subaru uh, naturally aspirated 2-liter and 2.5-liter H4s, boxer four-cylinder engines, um, they had some serious issues going a little bit further back. Uh, there was an oil consumption issue, which I know you had as well, but it used to be a lot worse. Yeah, so I, actually my wife had two Subarus, one from 96 ah, and the other one from perfect. 2015. Uh -huh. And the, tw in the 2000, sorry, 96 one, the Subaru Legacy that she had, detonated itself. But it only detonated, they uh, blew up uh, after 160, 70 something thousand miles. So it actually had some life mm -hmm. and yeah. then just went poof and disappeared. <laughs> yeah, it disappeared. <laughs> um, it had oil starvation, what happened was, and one of the cylinders just destroyed itself, basically. So the oil consumption issue got so bad that the federal government actually stepped in, forcing Subaru to replace several, several, so many, many, many two liter and 2.5 liter four cylinder engines back then. And when they said they had it all sorted, well, unfortunately, not quite, because his wife's 2015, 15, yeah. uh, you also had oil consumption, minor oil by comparison, minor, but yeah. you still had issues, right? Yeah, and, and they explained it this way. They said 
oh, it's it's okay. That's that's what the engine does. It consumes a little bit of oil. And I'm like, wait a minute. This is 2015. Mm-hmm. You know, if you told me, you know, my, my 1980s Porsche Boxster or my 1990s Subaru Boxster was consuming oil, it's kind of a normal thing. Right. But we're in a different decade. Right, right. You know, it shouldn't be the case. And also the oils are getting thinner and thinner, right? You know, zero W15. Which makes for more efficient, uh, less yeah, restriction. Yeah, but, but there's a side effect of that. You know, some of it seeps through and gets burnt. Yep. What that, are you going to do? Well, that well, is exactly what... And, you know, the other side of it is is that um, I love the, the, the four-cylinder Subaru engines out there, especially when they're turbocharged. Well, especially like the STI engines. Yep, yep. Um, I love hearing them. I, lo- I yes. love the power they put out. But the reality is they do consume oil. And these older ones that I'm referring to, uh, they consumed a lot of oil, and they were prone to failure. Uh, so not – it's not something that I want to necessarily just – slap around, oh, you're horrible, Subaru. No, it's just that this particular powertrain got so bad that the federal government had to step in. Believe me, we could have been talking about certain diesels in here, Volkswagen or even FCA. We we could have, yeah. But uh, that was too easy. So I'm only using Subaru and throwing them under the small bus. Uh, But, you know, for that vehicle, they actually, or that engine, they actually kind of deserved it. Now, uh, the next engine, you were talking about twin turbocharged V8s, weren't you? Yeah, I was talking about the Mercedes version of it. That was quite good. Uh, at least according to Mercedes. <laughs> I uploaded the wrong picture. It's Hold very on. small. Can, can you enlarge that a little bit? Oh, look at you go. Yeah, well, it's, it's really... Well, it's not the best resolution, no, but sorry well, about what that. is this engine? <laughs> what you're looking at is the N63. That's a twin turbocharged V8 BMW engine. Aha. Uh-huh. Fabulous engine when it's working. But when is it working? Uh, not so often. Uh-huh. Uh, one of the it is considered one of the most unreliable BMW powertrains out there. This once again, go ahead, look it up, guys. Um, I thought it was great. I've driven a few vehicles that have had this powertrain, and it's just it's a monster. However, there are several issues, many of which are dealing with tech issues. But also some mechanical issues that these engines have. And for some reason, BMW really dropped the ball building this powertrain. And a lot of people stay away from anything that's equipped with the N63. Uh, once again, it's a twin turbo charge V8, and it's just dreadful. Um, it, and it, it irritates me in such a way that it was so good when it was working right. Yet it had well, such a bad reputation. Well, aren't a lot of older German vehicles this way? Many. They're amazing. When I'm talking about the whole vehicle, not just the engine. Mm-hmm. They're amazing when they work. But when they don't work, they're so complicated that it's pretty bad. Yes. and But that leads me to this car. Whoa. Yeah. And it, it was this is the only car that had this powertrain. Now, what I'm referring to, of course, is Mazda RX-8 for those of you who are listening. You can see one here. We have a picture of it in the snow. Uh, I've driven every version of this, including the R3, which is their performance version. Holy cow, what a car. Um, It had the Renesis. Renesis. Rotary engine. Is it type of a Wankel? Yeah, but it's they they name they don't like using Wankel. They use uh, Renesis. Different branding. Yeah, yeah, different branding. Um, Okay, where to start? First of all, the reason why this engine is number one on my list. Is because there was of worst so, of worst yes. is uh, it had so much promise, it sounds absolutely amazing, and it can thrill you if you beat up on it and go crazy because this is a super high RPM powertrain. Rotaries, it's, it's a rotary, yes, like to go to eight, nine thousand, even ten thousand in some cases, you know, RPM, and they like it. They prefer being driven that way. In fact, if you don't drive them that way, everything kind of clogs up and they just die. Um, Oil issues, power issues, fuel consumption. There's a 1.3 liter or something like that in there. Small displacement. Yeah, but it just got crap mileage. They were just so bad, but but they were so good. That's what's really irritating. Here's the biggest problem about this powertrain. Because Mazda built this and put millions, if not billions, into building this engine, which was essentially a failure, they kind of lost their mojo in the sports car world because after this if you think about it once the the uh, rx8 disappeared shortly thereafter we lost our last sporty fun mazda which would be the um speed like the three, mazda speeds yeah. right 
And the last thing that's out there now is has nowhere near the character of this car, and that, of course, is the Miata. Now, they do have some great powertrains still. We already talked about them. They're yeah, the Skyactiv. Exactly. The turbocharged Skyactiv engines are fantastic. Um, but this vehicle could have, if it were more successful and, frankly, a little bit more thought out with the powertrain, this thing could have gone on to be something so special and it just didn't, and it absolutely ruined our chance to, to really have that proper, proper sports car, as opposed to a sporty, fun, coupe, little you know, convertible thing. So I kind of, I point at this car saying that this is the end of fun because of the way the engine was designed. Yeah, and it's, a, it's just a, it's a rotary, it's a different design. It's it is not, a different design. It's yeah. not a piston-driven, you know, circular piston-driven no. engine. It's a... It's a like tri-lobe combustion chamber. Triangle, baby. Total different design. And they did such a cool thing with the car itself, too. I mean, there was all these little extra, you know, rotary designs throughout the car. And the seats were cool. And you could kind of sort of hold four people in it. And it was just like they tried all these novel things with it. But at the end of the day, its overall performance for its price, but more importantly, its reliability, its oil consumption, its gas consumption... It's just no bueno. My cousin has one of these. He's got one Still? sitting. Yeah, and he's got a barn where it's sitting there. <laughs> and it wasn't running well, and he thought it was gone. He then decided just to crank it and go high RPM for a very long time. Ran perfect after that. Oh, he, uh, Italian tune job. <laughs> That's exactly what he did. Okay. Yeah. So anyway, guys, um, we want to know. Obviously, we did not cover. I mean, we just we're well, at the tip of the iceberg here. There's so many, many, many options. On both the good side and the bad side. So thank you for sticking around. We hope to hear your opinion. Uh, sorry we had to gloss over so many of them, but, you know, we have a limited amount of time to do this. Yeah. And once again, thank you to our Patreons. And let us know what you think in the comments yeah. below. And hopefully you're having a great holiday season starting with this, you know, Thanksgiving weekend. Mm -hmm. and, and we really appreciate you. Yeah, rock on, turkey people. We'll see you next time.